threatened by pregnancy. In the old days when the hospitals weren't so advanced, when medicine was so advanced, becoming pregnant, giving birth, could become life and death. Life for the child, but death for the mother. Until today, it poses significant risks. Becoming pregnant, having a child is not an easy thing, brothers. Don't take it for granted that this nine months the mother is carrying the child is something easy. They could have several of them, no problem. It shouldn't be a big deal. Why are mothers and uh, people in the media talking about becoming mothers, so becoming such an issue? No, brothers. You cannot imagine how difficult it is. It is so difficult, the Quran has mentioned the difficulty of it. How did your mother carry you in pregnancy? Did she carry you and not care about you? When you were born, when in the first few days, did your mother ignore if you were crying for milk? If your mother had food for herself and food for the infant, would she care about herself before she cared for the infant? If it was a matter of choosing between her life and the infant's life, would not a mother gladly give her life to save her son's life or her daughter's life? This is the condition of a mother. When she gives birth to the child, she will do anything to keep that child alive. She will suffer cold, she, she will suffer death, she will suffer pain, she will suffer injury. She will do whatever she can to protect this child. In this case, how do we repay a parent like that? How do we treat such a parent who is willing to give their life to save us? A mother will go days without sleep. I've seen it. I recently had a son. The first that I've had, his name is Hussein. I saw for the first few days when my wife gave birth, one of the days he, he had a fit, he was coughing, and his milk came up and he started to shake. For two days after that, my wife could not sleep. I said, it's fine, it happened once, it won't happen again. She could not sleep for two days. She kept her eyes open, she was staring at him for two days. I went to sleep, but my wife could not sleep. And the difference is because she gave birth to him, she carried him for these nine months, he became a part of her. She watches over him day and night. When I said to her, go take a break, go relax, go do something else, she says, no, I'm watching over him. I can't part from him. If she hears him coughing at night, a cough, everybody coughs. A cough, she wakes up. If she hears him just a little murmur, he says something, for example, he makes a little sound, she turns towards him straight away. She can be all the way somewhere else in the, in the house, every 10 seconds she comes back into the room to check. This is the state of mothers. We as fathers maybe don't understand this, that you're carrying something in you, you give birth to it, you nurture it, you make it grow. How attached do you come, become to this thing? Some of the brothers, they go out and buy things from the store, maybe a new phone, maybe a new laptop. How careful are you over it? You go and buy it from the correct store, you make sure it has a warranty, you make sure it's an original product, you put it in a case, maybe you go and get insurance for it, you buy the accessories, if one of your brothers or sisters touches it, don't touch it, this is mine, stay away from this. If it falls, you immediately go and look to check, oh, is it broken, is it okay? You clean it, maybe you buy some materials for it, yes? And it becomes old and you get a new model to make sure that you always have the best and you're so protective over it. Imagine this times a million is exactly what mothers feel for their children. SubhanAllah. We cannot imagine this as, as brothers, as fathers. But the mothers, they feel this. They don't need someone to tell them. They don't need a book. They don't need anyone to inform them how to feel. It is something inside. And that's why they're willing to die to keep this infant alive, to keep this infant well. So the Quran describes this, it says, So be good to your parents. One of the reasons why you should be good to your parents, specifically your mother, is because she carried you despite her body failing, becoming weaker and weaker. The Prophet was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was asked, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Prophet was asked, Ya Rasulullah, a man came to see him, he was not from Hijaz, he was from outside. He said, Ya Rasulullah, how do you advise me or who should I most care about and deal with carefully in this life? He said, Ummuk, your mother. So the man said, okay, after who? The Prophet said, your mother. Second time. He said, okay, after. The Prophet said, your mother. And after the third time, the man said, and anyone else? Or who is next? Then he said, your father. So the attention given to the mother, the respect, the energy, the way that you treat your mother, is three times as much as should be given towards the father. Because she gave so much energy. And this is the Prophet saying, not me. A man came to Hajj, completed the Hajj, went to visit the Prophet in Medina and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have just come back from the Hajj. I have been taking care of my mother for the last 20 years. My father died 20 years ago. 
I have been taking care of my mother, making sure her clothes are clean, making sure that she eats well, making sure she doesn't need anything. I watch over her. Every day I spend a part of my day taking care of my mother. If she is ill, I take her to the doctor. If she needs anything, I answer her call. She has never needed anything in these 20 years. And just now, despite we, the fact that we live 20 days journey, I carried my mother on my back. I took her towards Mecca. We did the tawaf with her on my back. We did the sa'i with her on my back. We went to Arafah with her on my back. We stayed in Muzdalifah with her on my back. We went to the Jamra for three days and went to Mina and did the A'mal for three days and she was on my back. And now I have brought her to visit you. I think, or will you agree with me, Ya Rasulullah, that I have done? The Prophet said, La Allah. No, you have not. The man was astounded. He said, Rasulullah, after all this, I have not been good enough to her. He said, no, because while you are good to her now, you wish for her death. You wish that one day this will end. So this is a truth for you, you don't want it to stop. But when she did it for you, when she carried you, when she fed you, when she looked after you, she wished for your life. She wished for you to be alive and nothing to happen to you, but you wish that one day this will end, the mother goes and you don't have to do this anymore. So Allah, this is the truth. This is the honest truth. The man treats this as a chore when he takes care of his mother this way, but the mother does not think of that when she has the baby. She cannot think of anything else. All her attention is towards the baby and the child. So this is part of the reasoning why Allah says, you will pay attention, you will be good to your parents. Wa wasayna al-insana bi waladay, hamalatu ummuhu wahnan ala wahn. She carried you even though it led to her body failing and becoming weaker and weaker. weaker. Wa fisalahu fi amain. Fisalahu means this period in which he is an infant and the mother will breastfeed him. The mother will give him milk and take care of him. It is two years. This period when the child is born and the period which the mother should breastfeed the child, take care of the child, give energy and attention to the child is two years. There is a complex set of thick rulings regarding breastfeeding. How it is recommended to do it, that the mother should be on wudu, for example. And there's a story here. The mother of Sheikh Murtad al-Ansari, called Sheikh al-A'zam, Sheikh al-Fuqaha, he uh, was buried in Najaf in the year 1860, so 150 years ago. All the mujtahids who are alive today are from the school of Sheikh Murtad al-Ansari. He's buried in Najaf. He's the author of al makasid He's the author of Farad. Very famous scholar, the great mujtahid of his time. When he became the mujtahid of his time in the 1840s in Najaf, his mother was still alive. And some of the people came to visit his mother and said, MashaAllah, you must be so happy that your son, Shaykh Muttal Ansari, has now become the Grand Mushtail of the Shia world. She said, I'm not surprised. So I said, why not? She said, I never brought my son near to me. I never breastfed him without wudu. I never did breastfeeding without reciting the mustahab dua. I never finished breastfeeding with him without reciting the dua. She said, of course, if I, if I follow the injunctions of the al if I follow what the al have commanded us, doing this, the good things, the mustahabbat, the wajib, maybe if we look at the wajib, it's this much that we have to do. Very basic things. Salah, salam, hajj, it's a few things in our life. It's not difficult. But if you look at the mustahabbat, they're this much. There's so many mustahab things you, that you can do. You don't have to. But if you do, you become like the mother of Shaykh Muntal Ansari. You give birth to someone like Shaykh Muntal Ansari. You raise up someone like Shaykh Muntal Ansari. But that doesn't mean just the wajib, that means adding up all the mustahabbat. We mentioned Salat al the other day, now we're talking about even every time. Do you know how many times a mother has to breastfeed in a day? Eight times, sometimes nine, sometimes ten. Imagine that every time. So you have to do Salat how many times? Three times a day. You do five prayers three times a day, yes? So you do three times all those sometimes. In winter time, maybe you're lucky, the times are close, you only need to do all those twice. Imagine nine times, in addition to the Salah, going to do wudu to breastfeed. Yet look what she gained. She gained one of the greatest scholars in history, in Shia Atna Hashri Fiqh. So, Fisalahu Fi Amin is very important here. The advice is to the mothers, but also for the fathers to support the mothers. The mother cannot breastfeed the child if she has to cook and clean and take care of the other children and clean up the house and make sure everything is ready for you and everything is warm and everything is neat and she can't sleep if the baby needs any help, any change or whatever, you're not interested. The mother can't keep producing milk like that, it's impossible. She needs rest, 
She needs to be able to sit for a bit. She needs to be able to relax. She needs to be able to get some sleep. Otherwise, it's just science, brothers. It's, it's, it's biology. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't make it go away. You can't change it. This is the physiological demands of the human body. To produce milk, the mother needs sleep and rest. She needs to eat well and sleep well. How many of us have neglected this part? We think that it flows automatically, that the mother will make milk, and she doesn't need any extra help from me. Brothers, please, pay attention to these things. If you are young ones and you see your mother needing help, help your mother. If your mother has a younger brother or sister than you, help her. Mother, what can I do for you today? Can I take out the rubbish? Can I clean up the house? Can I vacuum cleaner? How easy is it to vacuum the house? Very simple thing. You just go around 10 minutes, it's all done. It's a little bit of exercise and you go and you clean. It doesn't take that much effort, brothers. But how much have you helped your mother now? She doesn't have to worry about that task. Those 10 minutes, she adds to the time that she's going to rest. If you have brothers and sisters with you, you feed them, you prepare food. So many things in the kitchen help us now. Microwave, you press a button, one minute the food is ready. Yes, you won't need to uh, you know, go to all the lengths of heating up. In the old days, they used to bring fire, firewood and bring a, a, a big pot and it takes half an hour to get ready. Then they have to put the food in and it takes ages to stir it. Two hours, now it's one minute, it's done. But you've taken that task of your mother. She can pay attention to your younger brother and sister. Make sure, as the Quran says, Bisalu fi amain. Those two years are critical for the child. Those two years are when the child gets everything from the mother. That moment he's attached to the mother, he gets the love for the Ahlul Bayt. He gets ingredients, minerals, vitamins. He gets supplements. That's in this daily life, you have to go to the store and buy multivitamins. They cost you so many pounds. Or some of the brothers, they, they go to the gym, they buy these big powder things. 30, 40 pounds, so they get lots of muscle. All the baby needs is some time with the mother. And Allah has described these two years. If he gets that from the mother, he becomes strong. Rahimallah, ummi innaha sharibat min hubbil wasi wa ghaddatni fil labani fa kuntu mindi wa da ahwa aba hasani. The poet says, May Allah have mercy on my mother. She drank from the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib and then she fed it to me and so I became loving Ali ibn Abi Talib because of me and my mother. Because my mother fed this love to me through the milk that I become to love Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this is a critical period and the Quran is describing it. So now we start the Quran before this verse begins talking about Tawheed. Then respect and be good to your parents. Why? Because your mother carried you despite her threatening her own life. And now for the two years, she's going to wean you. She's going to carry you. These two years are critical. The child can't feed himself. The child can't speak. The child can't walk. The child can't uh, go and grab things. The child is too short, too weak. Any virus can endanger his health. You'll see the first two years when you have a child, those of you who do not have, and Allah will bless you with a child, inshallah, you will see how difficult the first two. Every week or two weeks, something comes to the child. Either he's a fever, or he gets some coughing, or he, there's a heart murmur, or you have to go to the hospital for something, he gets vaccinations, he doesn't feel so well. This happens. Those two years are difficult. So assist and be good to your parents, that's what I'm saying, because those two years, your mother won't think about anything except to keep you safe and to keep you healthy. وَفِصَالَهُ fi amin. So this period that she takes care of you and breastfeeds you is two years. وَفِصَالَهُ fi amin. And أَشْكُرَ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ And so after the injunction, to be good to your parents because your mother carried you despite threatening her own life and that she weans you for two years. Thank me, Allah says. Thank me, be thankful to me and to your parents. Okay, so let's look at the first part. Be thankful to me. Why be thankful to Allah? Because first of all, that He has given you life. Life is something to be enjoyed, something to be treasured. It is a blessing. I mentioned, I think yesterday, that there are millions of planets out there. I'm sure there is some other kind of life out there. But be thankful to Allah for giving you the experience that you get to see life. He did not have to create you, you could not be born. But you wouldn't have had these experiences. 
If, inshallah, we are fortunate enough by the blessings of the Holy Family of the Prophet, we are able to enter Jannah, how much richness do we add to our lives? What will we see there? What great experiences will we have? Allah could not decide not to give this to you. Allah could not create you and you won't have felt this. You won't have experienced this. But Allah has been grateful. Allah has uh, given you something for you to be grateful for. And that is life itself. And you get to see and experience and feel and touch and smell and laugh and see your family and see your children and see your friends. And if you're fortunate, you go to Ziyara. If you're fortunate, you're on the path of Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you're fortunate, people say good things about you. If you're fortunate, every day you pick up the wab. If you're fortunate on the day of judgment, Allah says you can be the one who will enter heaven and join the rest of the good people. So it's a great experience this life. So be thankful. Number one, for giving life to you. Number two, for giving you good parents. Be thankful for receiving these type of parents that the Quran describes. She carried you despite the threat to her life and getting weaker and weaker. Be thankful that you have these kind of parents. Be thankful to me for giving you such parents. That the mother will risk her own life to keep you alive. That the father will work hard to make sure you come out a decent person. That he will do his best to provide whatever he can for you. Some of the fathers I know in this community and others, they work 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day. I look at them, they don't have huge amounts of wealth, but what do they have? They tell me, my son has an education. My daughter is healthy. My other son gets what he wants. My other daughter can go out to the market and buy what she wants. They are comfortable. They have a future. The father will kill himself to work hours. Some brothers out there, they work seven days a week. Some brothers out there work from day till night. No machine would work that many hours. Even a machine has to be serviced, switched off, given some rest. I see some brothers out there, they work long hours. What for? Not to put the money in his account and he'll be happy with himself to buy him a flashy car or to buy him something nice. He says, well, I do it for my children. So they have the opportunity to go to the best university so that I can give them the best health care, so that I make sure they are comfortable in their life. Maybe I did not get such a chance, I'll make sure they have such a chance. Well, because my parents did give me that, I want to make sure I likewise do that. My father used to work so hard, I have to work as hard to give to my parents. So the Quran is saying, be thankful to Allah for life, be thankful that I have given you such parents, and in order to thank me, go and be thankful to your parents. Thanking your parents means thanking me as well. Being good to the creations of Allah is being good to the Creator. Sending your thanks to the creation is sending thanks to the Creator. Being thankful for what the creation does is being thankful for the Creator. If a doctor saves your life and you say thanks, this is also thanks to Rabbil Alameen. Because Rabbil Alameen made that doctor and gave him the abilities to do what he does to save your life. Everything on this life, everything that we see today is through the power of Allah. Whether direct or indirect, and your parents are indirect, they give life to you, but Allah has given life to them. So Allah, through them, brings you. So be thankful to them to be thankful to Allah. And why be thankful to your parents? Because what do they do for you? They give you everything in their lives. Their dream is to see you become the best. The best in your class, the best in your family, the best in your neighborhood, in whatever way. The best of akhlaq, the best of knowledge, the best of practice, the best of reputation. Your parents look for the best in you. Reward a good deed with a good deed. What do we recite in the qunut of the salah? It is one of the most mustahab qunut to, to say. Rabbi, ighfirli wa li walidayya warhamhuma kama rabbayani saghira wajzihima bil ihsani ihsana wa bil sayyati afwan wa ghufrana. This is the dua of Ibrahim. Ibrahim is described as Khalilullah, the friend of Allah. He communicated with Allah directly. He spent many years conversing with Allah. He was that close to him, yet he recites in his dua, Oh Allah, oh my Lord, forgive me and my parents and be merciful upon them because they were merciful to me when I was young. And whatever good they have done, reward them with good. And whatever bad they have done, 
be merciful to them. SubhanAllah. Look how much in this dua there is so much affection and so much uh, thanks to Rabbil Alameen and so much hope that you can reward your parents in something, a little bit. Allah, if I can do something with my parents, let me pray for them at least. If you are, have lost your parents, dedicate a time of the week to remember them. Thursday night, the mustahab night for a lot of Ahmad. The Friday, the whole of Friday is a mustahab day for Ahmad. Recite some prayers. If they have, have passed away, you can do qada prayer for your parents. Qada al-subh, salat al-subh, qada al-bukh, al-hasb, maghrib al-hisha. Even if you know your parents, never miss the prayer. It is still mustahab to pray qada for them. You stand after you finish your wajib salah, recite the qada prayers for your father or your mother. It is mustahab to send somebody or to go yourself if you can on Umrah or Hajj for the thawab of your parents. If they have been to the Hajj, excellent. If they have not, it is still mustahab to send someone else to go again to the Hajj for them, to go to the Umrah for them. It is mustahab for you to sit and recite the Quran once a week for your parents. Once a week, if you can go to their grave and recite it, this will make them happy. If you cannot and they're far away from you, pick up the Quran and recite a chapter. Recite Surah Yasin, Surah Al Waqa'ah, other chapters, long or short, whatever time you can give 5, 10, 15 minutes. When you recite Dua Kumay on Thursday, everyone recites Dua Kumay. Do it with the intention of reciting it for your parents also. You recite it on your behalf and also for your parents. Include them in your amal every time you do a good amal. For example, one of the brothers could walk in here and decide to give out some food. He wants to gain thawab, he gives out some food. Let him give it out with the intention of doing it for my mother and father so they get thawab as well. If you're going to fast, the mustahab fasts. You'll see these months and, and weeks that come by, lots of days that are mustahab to fast. The whole of Rajab is mustahab, the whole of Shaban is mustahab. Fast for you and include your parents in your niyyah. So I fast for myself and also for my uh, blessed parents who have passed away. Include them in your amal. Make them as if they were still with you today. Every time you gain something, they gain something as well. Help contribute towards projects, as I mentioned the other day. Things that continue after your death. Things that can benefit people. Books, centers, hospitals, schools, sponsoring students, giving to orphans. All sorts of things. Whenever you want to do anything, even if you want to put one pound in one of those donation boxes. One pound. Everybody can afford one pound. As you are doing it, this is from me and from my mother so-and-so or my father so-and-so. Immediately death of is gained as well. There's so many things that we can do to include our parents in and we'll make sure that we are paying a little bit. Not, not a lot. Don't think you're doing too much for your parents. You're not. Because the, the man that said to the Prophet was amazed when the Prophet said, no, you have not done. He said, 20 years, I carried on my back. He said, no. Because you do it as a chore, she does it because she wants to. She wants to see you live your life properly. You want to see the end of her. So we do not want to become like this person expecting that we've done enough for our parents, I did this, I was good, I took care of my brothers and sisters. No, you have done only a small bit and you can do much more. So at this point when Allah says, وَأَشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ Give thanks to me and to your parents. It means thanks in all ways. Saying nice words to them, being kind. Imam Zayn al when he looks at uh, the hukuk, the rights of the parents. He says, amongst the rights are that you never give them a look of dissatisfaction. How many times I say about myself, if my mother asks me to do something, go and take this out. Oh, just saying that off in the Quran is forbidden. Just giving my mother that look of dissatisfaction is forbidden. Imam Abdi says you can't do that with your parents. Giving them the look, not even saying anything, just the look of, I'm not happy. You're not allowed to do that. Saying something that shows your displeasure with them is not allowed. So to say, I don't want to. No, I will not. To show disobedience, to show dissatisfaction is not allowed as well. For you to do anything that angers them is not allowed either. The anger could be many things. You could be doing something that you think is okay according to what your friends say, according to what your standard is, but your parents aren't happy with it. The only time in your life in which you are allowed to go against the commands of your parents or the wishes of your parents is if they tell you to do something that Allah does not approve of. If they tell you not to pray, if they tell you not to fast, if they tell you not to go to Hajj and it is wajib only. Whenever they tell you to do something that Allah has forbidden, then this is the problem. 
You and the Quran says, do not follow in the next verse. The Quran says, do not follow them when they command you to go against Allah's wishes. But and even then, but say to them kind words. So even when if your parents were telling you to do bad things, you have to refuse, but refuse in a nice way. Subhanallah. Till this point, you still have to be kind to them and nice to them. One of the companions of the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I left behind in uh, another town. My mother, she was from a different faith. What shall I do? The Prophet said, leave, go back and take care of your mother. He said, Ya Rasulullah, she's not from our religion. It doesn't matter. You have gained this star, good, go back and take care of your mother. This is an obligation. Believe in Allah, take care of your parents. Go back. He went back to his mother. Immediately as soon as he arrived, when he left, he was a different person, he came back, he was someone else. He began to take care of her more, he began to smile every day, he began to answer her wishes, he would do things before she asked. She said, my son, what has happened to you in this period? You've changed. What is this you've become? He said, this is not from me. There is a man who has taught us to become like this. She said, I want to meet this man. Who is it that has this effect on people? She is taken to the Prophet and she asks him questions. She says, oh you who have commanded my son to become a better person, what do you ask for in this life? He said, I don't ask anything except that people love my family. So this is one sign. Number two, do you want wealth from us? Do you want to take some of our money? He said, no. There is part of it that you give to Allah, that you spend on people. She said, this is the second sign that he has answered. The third, she says, if I have something, would you be able to tell me what it is right away? He said, no, all my knowledge is from Allah. I seek answer and I give to you. She said, this is the third. He is the prophet. Because these three things, not anybody can have. Only the special people. Then she said, I will become. On your faith, I will join this religion of yours. So the son's behavior, he did not open books for her, he did not convince her to become a Muslim. Just his actions, the things that the Prophet has recommended to us, has convinced her to become a Muslim. So today when we live our life and give thanks to our parents, if they're Muslim, Alhamdulillah. If they're not, let us act in the right way. If they're telling us to do good things, let us respond in kindness. At never at any point, Allah never says at any point you be disrespectful to them. At never at any point. It is forbidden. Imam said, Abdi in his the, the treatise on, on, on rights, he says, these are forbidden for you to look the wrong way, to utter some word in the wrong way, to say something that pleases them, to, dis to disobey them, it's forbidden. All of these things are forbidden. And then Imam Zina Abdi continues, and he says for the parents, raise your child for seven, he means seven years, raise your child for seven. Teach your child for the next seven and befriend your child for the last seven. So the first seven years of the child's life, raise him. So at this, if you're six, five, four, three, seven, know what your parents are trying to do is an obligation from the Imams. They're trying to raise you, teach you manners, teach you akhlaq, teach you the way you should behave, so learn from them. And then seven, you're going to be taught. The parents will teach you salah, teach you the wajib of things, teach you the akam of tahara, teach you what you must do in terms of reading the Quran properly. They will teach you these, this part. They will spend money, they will take you to school, they will take you to tutors, fathers will drive you, go through traffic and come back and pick you up again. They'll work very hard to make sure this seven years now in the middle of your life, you get an education, an Islamic education. They make sure you know now why you are a Muslim. And then from that age, so from 14 years old, for the next seven years, befriend them. Become friends with them. Your father will begin to rely on you. Yes? You reach that age 14, 15, your father needs your help now. Your father becomes elderly. He begins to trust you. He begins to hand over things to you. He begins to have you become his representative. He maybe uses you in his business affairs. Your father begins to trust you to, to take care of the family. Your father may travel and leave you to take care of the house. So in this age, you become the friend of your mother and father. If you're the daughter, the mother at this age treats you like a sister. You're not a child anymore. She befriends you, you begin to spend time together like your friends. You have fun together, you sit and talk together, you share things. So this is the injunction of the Imam. Seven years you raise them, seven years you teach them, seven years you befriend them. Then after they will become parents themselves and they will have to go through this cycle. And then you remember your parents. 
and say, SubhanAllah, I remember that time. The same thing has happened to me. If you do good, good will happen to you. If you do bad, bad will happen to you. If you're bad to your parents, your son will be bad to you. This is a given. This is a formula. If you do not become good to your parents, Allah will make sure the same happens to you. Allah will make sure you have a child who is not good to you. And then you'll remember, ah, oh, I know why this has happened now. Because I did not follow the commandments of Allah. And Allah ends this verse saying, وَإِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ And to me is your return. You will come back to me. I will have all the records. And I will see how did you treat your parents. So it doesn't matter that you prayed, did your hajj, did your song, you gave your zakat, you were good to the people. If you're bad to your parents, this is one of the kabara, the major sins. This is the one that every time Allah mentions Tawheed, He mentions be good to your parents. Tawheed, worship in one God, be good to your parents. How important is this? Worship Allah, be good to your parents. Don't say worship Allah, do this and do this and do this, and be good to your parents. It says worship Allah, be good to your parents. Be good to your parents. What kind of injunction? So Allah is counting this. Like your salah, like your song, like he's watching all of this. And on the day of judgment, he will be the person who says, yes, you were good to your parents. Well, unfortunately, this is the one that's going to make you fail. So, brothers and sisters, being religious, doing my salah, being a good person, without being good to my parents, no matter who they are, no matter what their background is, is not enough. Make sure, do not take this thing lightly, especially in a foreign country like this, especially when our family ties are difficult to keep, especially when there are so many things out there in the society that show us how to break a family up. Divorce rates are increasing, even in the Muslim community, let's be honest. We have problems in our communities. Newly married couples, I see it on the rise every day. They're newly married, six months there is a divorce. Lots and lots of problems. Some of it is external factors, some of it is internal. But this country is not easy to live in. It is easier to live single, on your own, don't talk to your parents, don't need to have children, don't need to have a partner, and that's it. No responsibilities. Easier to do that than to have a family and keep good ties and take care of your brothers and sisters and be good to your mother and father and make sure you have decent sons and, and daughters. This is the harder thing in this country. It's turned around. So you have an obligation. It is like if I bring you a container of acid and I drop something in there, maybe a ring, maybe some money, what will happen? It will start to corrode. You have to make sure you strengthen yourself so that even in this acid, you're still protected. It may affect you a little bit, but much less. You put a shield on. When it's cold, what do you do? You wear a jacket, you put a scarf, you put a hat to protect yourself against the cold. Likewise here. So we take the words of Manzil Abdi. Don't listen to me. Go and pick up Risat al It's translated in English. It's available online. Pick it up. Look at the part when he talks about the rights of parents. Look at it. Understand it. Apply it. Don't just read it and say, Oh, mashallah, mashallah, that's a problem. No, no. Apply it. Look at what the Quran says in this bit. Say, right, let me look at this. Okay, I understand it. Let me apply it. Apply it for your sake, like putting on the jacket to protect you from the cold, to protect you in this country, to protect you in an environment that is hostile. It's very difficult, brothers and sisters, to make our families safe and secure and on the path of their beat. It's not easy. Don't think, and the advice is to the parents say, don't think that taking my son to this, that's it, it's done. That's it, I've done my bit. It doesn't work like that. Oh, I took him to the madrasa, they, they take care of him. I was a madrasa teacher. I had these parents come in, they drop their children off at the door, they disappear, they come back. When we do the end of school year report, and I say his behavior is like this, behavior is like, what? That's your job. I said, Ajib, I have four hours with your child, and you want me to raise him for you? And he spends the rest of the week, goodness knows, in which school. And how do you pay attention to him? Do you know what he's doing in his room? And you bring him here for me to raise? No, this is your obligation. I teach, not raise. Raising is your obligation, so brothers, Mothers, if you can hear me, please, do not leave this bit when someone is teaching your children, raising them to someone else, to Facebook, or to the internet, or TV, or to Xbox, or to the neighbor. It is something you have to do, your obligation. Raise them for seven, teach them for seven, befriend them for seven. It doesn't say give them to the neighbors, give them to Facebook. No, no, it's your obligation. So please, brothers, mothers, fathers, Make sure you look into what your children are doing. We're not asking you to surveil them and, and become 
uh, you know, some kind of police state over them. No. Make sure you know what they are doing. Take an interest in what they do. Ask how they are at school. Ask how they are at the madrasa. When you bring them to a madrasa, don't just throw them in the hall and that's it. Keep an eye on them. Sit them next to you. I see some of the brothers, they do this. They have their children next to them and they explain. If I say something that is not clear, they explain to their children. Do this. If this speaker is not good or they can't understand, take him to another speaker. You might not like it, but at least your child will gain. Go to another speaker so they understand. If he's struggling with this language, if he doesn't understand English or Arabic or Urdu Farsi, take him to somewhere where he does understand the language. It might mean you have to drive one hour, but it's easier for me to drive one hour than later on I'm sitting and thinking, what happened to my, my son or daughter? I can lose one hour a day rather than lose 20 years of life later on. If one day, last time, Allah, my son comes and has done so and so, what will I say? Rabbi Ayman said, why did you bring him into this life? If you could not raise him, why did you have him? And we know this. These days now, we're looking at some of the signs of the appearance of the Imam. Does any one of us want to give birth to the Dajjal? How do we know he does not come from our community? He could be born from one of us. It is a possibility. Do you want to be responsible for that? Do you want to be the person who gives birth to the Dajjal? The Dajjal is not going to be born by himself. He will be born of a mother and father, like me and you. You want to make sure you avoid this. If not the Dajjal, do you want to give birth like the people who joined I'm one of Saad's army and killed him up and said, do you want to give some birth to someone like that? No. So you have to make sure you protect your children against this. So the obligation is on parents to take care of the children. The obligation is on children to take care of their parents. The obligation is on partners to find good partners. I have to find the best wife and the best husband. Not because of their looks or their wealth or their name or fame or anything like that. Because they are going to be good parents. And this is the advice, or this is the request that Amir al-Mu'mineen has for his mother, Haqeel. He says, Ya Haqeel. This is after the death of Fatima al Zahra. He says, Ya Haqeel, go and find me a woman from the Arabs of this area that will give birth to lions. Haqeel says, what will you do with these lions? He said, because Allah has decreed for Hussein to go into a major battle. And these lions will join and support their brother Hussein. Aqil was known to be someone who understood lineages and he would go and he was well connected to the community. Aqil went and asked, at the time he was asking, a woman called Fatima bint Hizab al Kilabiya. She had a dream. She saw in her dream, she told her father, she saw in her dream that the moon and four stars came into her house and sat next to her, sat in her lap. She asked, what does this mean? Her father asked for the interpretation. They told her, you will marry someone famous, someone with high regard, and will give birth to four great sons. Aqil recommends Fatima bint Hizab al-Kilabiyya to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen takes the advice, goes to propose, the marriage happens. Fatima bint Hizab al-Kilabiyya comes to Medina. She is about to enter the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen for the first time. She says to him, Ya Ali, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, when I enter this house, you can't call me Fatima anymore. He says, why Fatima is the best of names? She said, because Al-Hasan and Hussein will remember their mother Fatima. If you call me Fatima in front of them, they will begin to cry. They will remember what happened to Fatima. They will miss Fatima to Zahra. Call me something else. Call me Ummul Baneen, the mother of the sons, because inshallah I will have sons to support your sons. So Amir al refers to her from that day as Ummul Baneen. She enters the house, she raises Al Hassan and Hussein like her own children and takes care of them more than she does of her own children. When Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is born, she brings him towards Amir al-Mu'mineen. She says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, here is the son that you wanted. Amir al-Mu'mineen takes him, he kisses his hand, he kisses his head, and then he kisses his hands, left and right, he begins to cry. He begins to take his arm and look at it this way, look at it that way. Amir al-Mu'mineen's heart is beating. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, is there something wrong with my son? Ya Ali, have you seen something? Why are you crying? Why are you looking at his arms in this way? He says, no, no, but one day something will happen to these two arms of his. This is why I am crying. Umar bin says, what? 
He says he will lose his hands left and right in the battle. I kissed him on his head because he will be struck by an arrow here. He will die serving his brother Hussein. She says, for this I am happy. Yes, if it is for Hussein, I am happy. Go. And the days go. Al-Abbas prepares to leave Medina. She says to Al-Abbas, leave this son of yours with me. Go and focus your attention on Hussein. Go towards Kufa, go towards Karbala. Keep all your energy towards Hussein. I will take care of this infant of yours. And she waits and waits until one day she hears commotion in the markets. What is happening? There is news, there is news of Hussein. She comes, she sees this poet, Bishop Nahadlam, crying, Ya Ahla Yathrabala Muqam Alakum Liha. Qutir Hussein Fa'il Mu'im Udwal. Oh, people of Yathrab, people of Medina, leave Medina. Hussein is because she says, What? Come closer, what are you saying? Bishop says, I was looking at this woman who's carrying a child. I said, Who is this woman? She looks a bit different. They said, This is Umar Benin. He said, Oh, Umar Benin, she lost four, four sons in battle. Let me tell her the sad news. Umar Benin, may Allah reward you for the death of your son Abbas. She begins to cry, she said, I did not ask you about Abbas. Tell me what happened to Hussein. He says, Allah, Allah, like an edge for your brother, your other sons, Abdullah or Muhammad. She said, I did not ask you about Abdullah or Muhammad. What happened to Hussein? He says, Allah, like an edge for your Hussein. He says, I looked at her, she fell on the ground, the child fell from her arms. She begins to weep. She makes her way to say to Zainab's house. Zainab is inside. She says to the servant, don't let anyone in because today is a sad day for us. The servant comes back. She says, there is a woman at the door. She calls herself Umar Benin. She says, let her in, let her in. She is one of us. Umar Benin enters. She begins to cry. Assalamu alaikum, ya Aba Abdullah. Oh, ya Aba Abdullah, where have you been? What does Zainab reply to her? Wa akha, wa abbasa. Oh, my brother, wa abbas, we have missed you today on this day. This is the tragedy of the Al Bayt. This is the attention of Umar Benin to her son. This is the love of Al Abbas for his brother Hussein. Inna lillah wa inna alayhi raji'oon. Wa sayyadamu ladina zalim wa ayyya wa falibin yankalibun. Inna lillah. Brothers, please, on these nights, we request du'a. I have been sent some messages, brothers have asked for du'a. There are people in this country that need your du'a. Our brothers and sisters, I mentioned this on the first night, there have been messages being sent to brothers and sisters abroad that we will kill you if you hold the majalis of Imam Hussein, that they're threatening the zawar of Imam Hussein. Please, some of us are in desperate need of du'a. So on these days, when we inshallah recite the du'a, we recite it with a full heart. There is a verse in the Quran that should be recited for hardship. So inshallah we will recite it five times together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَى وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ 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 أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَى وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ يَا اللَّهِ يَا رَحْمَانُ يَا رَحِيمُ يَا مِقَلِّبَ الْقُلُوبِ ثَبِّتْ قُلُوبَنَا عَلَى دِينِكْ We ask Allah to answer the call of all our brothers and sisters to keep our families safe, to give good health to those that need it, to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam, Ajallah Farj al-Sharif, to make us servants of the 12th Imam, to make sure that we follow the path of the 12th Imam and that we answer the call of the 12th Imam. We give our thanks to our parents and to the people who con congregate in these majalis, the people that set up these messages for you, the parents of the people that have passed away and made this center what it is and have given their time to the service of Imam Hussein, as tawab for their souls, the souls of your parents, your family members, the mu'mineen, we will recite Surah Al-Fatiha with salawat.